Hi and welcome to Destination Michigan. We're here to explore the beauty, creativity, and destinations in our Great Lakes state. Tonight we'll meet some outstanding Michiganders and we'll travel across the mitten to visit the communities that make Michigan unique. Tonight's journey embarks in the Eastern Upper Peninsula, home to one of only four wooden boat building schools in the nation. Next, Stephanie Mills will step into the wild at the Grand Rapids John Ball Zoo. After that, a little cheese and cake tasting is on our to-do list. Then Bob Garner introduces us to Greg Abbas and his hunting products made in Beaverton. I'm Courtney Jerome, and you're tuned in to Destination Michigan. Support for Destination Michigan is provided by the CMU Bookstore. T-shirts, sweatshirts, hats, maroon and gold memories, and an official outfitter of Adidas apparel at the Central Michigan University owned and operated CMU Bookstore. Online shopping seven days a week at cmubookstore.com. The CMU Bookstore, online at cmubookstore.com, on campus in the University Center, and game day locations at Kelly Short Stadium and the CMU Event Center. For many Michiganders, heading east after crossing the Mackinac Bridge is a rarity. However, when it happens, we realize the pristine eastern upper peninsula beauty of the Les Chenot Islands is truly worth the trek. The 36 islands provide sheltered channels and bays within the Straits of Mackinac. And off this Lake Huron coast lies the town of Cedarville, a historic harbor area for boarders and explorers. It's also the home of career craftsmen and hobbyists alike. With over 11,000 inland lakes and over 3,000 miles of Great Lakes shoreline, Michiganders are bound to see beautiful wooden boats coasting through our waters. If you see one up close, it's hard to miss the details and precision that goes into its building. Restoration and new boat building like these are done by talented craftsmen, mostly by a generation that's nearing retirement. Luckily, there's a new generation to pick up where they're leaving off. In the U.S., there are wooden boat building schools in New England and Seattle, but the only inland wooden boat building school is on the Great Lakes in the town of Cedarville. The other schools are on the coast, um, and that combined with the fact that there's such a maritime heritage, not only in our area, but throughout the state of Michigan and the broader Great Lakes area, that we just felt like that there would be an audience and a constituency for, for both our full-time and our summer students. A core group of Upers committed to their goal of beginning a school of their own created the Great Lakes Boat Building School, welcoming their first class of students in September 2007. The school's career program takes two years to complete. A lot of the students coming in have very limited or no woodworking skills, and so the program that, that our lead instructor, Pat Mahon, has set up really helps everybody start from a common point, and it just begins with a little step stool and then they'll build a shipwright's tool chest, then they'll build a pair of oars, and then they build a series of small boats, and then they work on their larger boats. And all this happens within a nine month period. To give you an idea of how intricate and dedicated a wooden boat craftsman has to be, look at the board this student is working on. Earlier in his first year, this one board would have taken two whole days to perfect. Now that he's at the end of his first year, he'll work on it for a good four hours. Second year, focuses on building a larger, more complex boat. Usually the boat will be 24 to 30 feet. Um, and besides building the boat itself, the students also learn what's called yacht joinery. They learn how to build all of the cabinetry uh, that goes into the boat. They also learn about uh, marine systems, how to install the engines, steering system, some of the controls that go in there. It, it's not a full marine systems program because that's a specialty in and of itself and people go for nine months just to learn that. But um, we teach the fundamentals of marine systems so that they're competent to install an engine and a steering system and, and that sort of thing in the boat. With typically an average of 17 to 20 students enrolled in career courses, they range in all ages, from right out of high school to people beginning their second careers. Alumni then find jobs in wooden boat building and restoration shops, or they start their own. 
but the Great Lakes Boat Building School also offers summer workshops for those who are interested in learning aspects of the craft without the commitment. We're the only one of the, of the four major boat schools that has an active summer program like this. We have a range of classes in the summer. The core projects are boat building classes. And these are, are component boats. Everything is, is already pre-cut. So basically what you're doing with an instructor's assistance is you're, you're putting that boat together. And it, it uses wood and epoxy, and so it's a very strong, light boat, very well designed. We had a woodworking for women class um, that they wanted to learn how to use the table saw and the planer and, and build something nice. And so they'll build an Adirondack chair, or they'll build a nice boat-shaped bookshelf. We have a flower rod making class this summer. We had a um, metal casting, a bronze casting class. So it's a real wide range of, of classes that we offer in the summer. While this range of classes varies from summer to summer, you'll find anything from paddle boards to kayaks to create. The school expanded partnerships in 2013 for these summer workshops. Nowadays, classes are held not only in Cedarville, but in Charlevoix and Traverse City too. It's partly about getting a boat built that they'll then go on and use. But it's also a tremendous family activity um, that fathers and daughters, fathers and sons, you know, grandfathers and grandsons do together. So it's a real mix of, of ages. And, and I guess one of the cool things is that it's a real bonding experience. You have to pay attention to what you're doing. Um, it is fun, but then when you leave here at the end of the week, you've got a nice boat that you can use uh, when you get back home. And so the whole thing is, got some immediate satisfaction and some long-term satisfaction when you're all done with it. For some, the satisfaction comes from a weekend, whole week, or two years spent learning the wooden boat building trade at the Great Lakes Boat Building School. And for others, we've gained a whole new appreciation for the beautiful wooden boats we see floating on our Michigan lakes. The Boat Building School has contributed millions of dollars to the Cedarville community and local economy since it began. Also something to note, the area has an annual boat show in August to celebrate a variety of vessels. To learn more about the Great Lakes Boat Building School, their website is glbbs.org. Now we'll head down the west side of Michigan's Lower Peninsula, where Destination Michigan's Stephanie Mills goes into the wild and gets up close with nature at the John Ball Zoo. Let's learn how this Grand Rapids destination works year-round to preserve wildlife. As soon as you enter the gates of the John Ball Zoo, street noise gives way to squeaks and squeals, along with plenty of oohs and ahs. You immediately feel like a kid again as you begin exploring all the different animal exhibits. Our journey began on one of their latest additions, this three-cart trolley called a funicular, where we learned a little bit about the zoo's history. We are one of the oldest zoos in the country. It actually, the zoo itself is over 100 years old. Um, it originally was donated, John Ball donated 40 acres to preserve and maintain um, for the purposes that we are using it for today. At the zoo, preservation lies at the heart of its mission. They have more than 2,000 animals who live here, including more than 240 different species. We are really, the mission of the zoo is to educate individuals about wildlife and really educate them on conservation in a way that they can take that back in and enact it in their lives. So really conservation, education, and animal care here at the zoo. From lions, tigers, and bears to more exotic ones in the tropics building, visitors will come face to face with animals not just found in Michigan, but around the world. So I would say there's a variety. Um, we actually have quite a few different small primates here at the zoo, uh, which is always great for visitors to get a chance to see. This year we're bringing on the forest realm habitat of our tiger exhibit. Um, so that will open up in the summer of 2014. Um, and then in spring of 2015, the other portion of the tiger exhibit will open up. And, and what's unique about this is the two different habitats really, you know, you would see Amher tigers here at the zoo. And the kind of habitats we're creating are really showing visitors that they can actually, uh, they're good swimmers and they can live around rivers and swim in, in ponds and that kind of thing, but they also live in a forest much like that that you see here. When you come to the John Ball Zoo, you're going to see and do things that you don't get to every day, like ride a camel. We have some that are interactive. 
uh, where you can go in and get a hands-on experience with animals. Some where we might interact with the animals from behind a barrier and you can see that. A large variety for people to experience and see and enjoy. If walking with wallabies is on your bucket list, along with some other close encounters, you're in luck. So here at the zoo, we try to create a family-friendly, interactive environment so really anyone of any age can come and learn about wildlife. The hands-on exhibits that we have involve pygmy goats to a corral with some larger goats um, and sheep as well. You could then travel across the world, maybe get a hands-on experience here with wallabies. They might come right down next to you. You can put your hands onto a stingray at the Stingray Lagoon. It took the stingrays a little while to warm up to us and our camera, but eventually, they came around. Now from stingrays to the eagles, all animals are kept under close supervision. 16 zookeepers oversee their care on a daily basis. The crucial role of zookeepers is uh, all aspects of animal care. So everything from, from cleaning to feeding to training to enrichment. Uh, we have to also do medical procedures. We have a vet staff, but a lot of the zookeepers here will help our vet staff with medical procedures. For some of the zookeepers, working here is just getting to do what they love to do. We get to work with a, a wide variety of animals, including some small mammals, and then uh, really the best part is the reptiles and amphibians in here. For taking care of this building, it's a lot of cleaning, a lot of care of them every day. So the first thing we do when we walk in the morning is check to make sure everyone's okay, which may not seem like a lot of work, but um, with this many animals in the building, it can take quite a while to make sure that everyone's you know, alive and well and, and, and happy and healthy. Keeping things natural and undisturbed is important not just for the animals, but for the overall feel of the zoo. The hilly landscape provides visitors with a unique opportunity to view exhibits from multiple angles. We've tried to create an experience that isn't just for your everyday zoo visitor as well. As people get up into the upper elementary and the middle school and high school range, they really enjoy some of the things like the zip line and the ropes course. You know, get up in the trees, get up in the space where animals live and get a chance to experience that environment. What it's like to be up in the trees like an animal. The zoo has also become a destination for many other events, including weddings inside their Bissell Treehouse with the Grand Rapids skyline serving as a beautiful backdrop. So as you can see, there are many fun, unique, and different ways to experience the zoo when you're here, but what matters most is what you leave with. We have these animals for visitors to come and see and interact with in some cases, um, and really they're here so that you can learn about them and hopefully take something home with you that allows you to act a little differently and hopefully apply that in your daily life to better the, the environment for the species in the wild. The zoo also has an outreach program where they take animals to schools and visit children in the hospital. They have helped fund more than 100 projects through their Wildlife Conservation Fund as well. To learn more about their programs and upcoming events, head to their website at johnballzoosociety.org. Our next stop in the Mitten is an area many drive through on trips up north. Running parallel to I-75 along the Saginaw Bay, the M13 stretch is where you'll find lots of great locations to stop at. Tonight we're chatting about the cheese that this area is most commonly known for. Back in the early 1940s, Bay County boasted with dairy farms and cheese manufacturing plants. In the 1990s, the last cheese manufacturing plant left, but the area is still known for their famous Pinconning secret recipe cheese, and they're even recognized with the title Cheese Capital of Michigan. It's not cheddar nor Swiss or Gouda that they're known for, Rather, the brand of cheese is Pinconning cheese, and there are several shops in the area that still process and sell that cheese today. There's Wilson's, the original uh, cheese shop in Pinconning. There's the Pinconning cheese store and fudge shop that's actually right across from Wilson's. It was one of the original highway cheese stores. And then further south, there's Williams Cheese, which is a big cheese processing and retail store there. Then on the advent of I-75 freeway put in, there's the cheese house that's out on the I-75 freeway exit out there. So that means you can buy Pinconning cheese north, south, east, and west of the cheese city. Their squeaky cheese is the freshest. People travel from all over the mitten and even farther to get their hands on these cheese curds. Of course, there's also mild, medium, sharp, and extra sharp cheese to taste everywhere you go. They all have blocks of cheese. 
uh, full blocks and that and they also age cheese at these places. That's some of the uniqueness of each of these. Now the process of aging pinconning cheese is an interesting one. We spoke with Michael Williams of the Williams Cheese Company in Linwood on how they take a cheese curd and turn it into different finishes of cheese. So aging, humidity, time is what makes a piece of cheese become from a mild state to a medium, to a sharp, to an extra sharp. And in cheese, in the case of cheese, it can take years to become an extra sharp piece of cheese. When we first start to cure the product, uh, it takes at least 30 days to get the cheese to become uh, more like a medium mild where the curd is softer and you get a mild flavor, which in the old days, the consumer had two things on their mind when they went to the supermarket. A piece of mild cheese, a mild piece of mild cheddar, or American cheese. And that's very mild, both concepts. But to get to a medium cheese, it can take as many as three to four months. For a good piece of sharp cheese, it can take six to nine months. And we pride on our, ourselves on extra sharp cheese, which can take years in some cases. When we talk about sharp cheese, we're talking about right here. That's what sharp cheese does to you. It, it's on your palate back in here, and it's something that's very unique. A visit to the Pinconning area is unique all on its own, as you can make a day of it tasting different shops cheeses and exploring businesses that have received national attention. Sporty's Wing Shack and Smokehouse was featured on the Food Network's Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives show. And Bittersweet Quilt Shop has been in Better Homes and Gardens magazine. We also have another uh, meat market called Valley's Meat Market. And uh, anybody that walks into it there will attest to it that the meat counter is just out of this world. I mean, it's, it's stacked high and he does over three million pounds of meat each year and they come in there early in the morning and they're cutting meat all day. The meat is fresh and they also have some pink county cheese there too to go along with it. So uh, I, I don't think you can walk in a place almost with a pink county though that you will not see some mentioned or a smile, a cheesy smile on everybody's face. The area celebrates pinconning cheese with their annual Cheese Town Challenge 5K and macaroni and cheese cook-off in June. Well, let's continue our travels to taste some creative cakes in Lake Ann. Stephanie Mills shows us how a northern Michigan woman is creating some truly unforgettable desserts. No wedding or birthday party is complete without a cake. Today we're introducing you to a Lake Ann woman whose decadent creations aren't just delicious, but true works of art. I love to decorate them. I like to do all the little work, all the flowers, all the, um, so it's actually the decorating that I love. I do like to bake, I love to eat cake, but I really love to decorate. I love to see the, the end product of the fruits of my labor, I guess you could say. <laughs> Ann Bearclaw's uniqueness is on display year round along her road just west of Traverse City. Over the past 25 years, she's baked thousands of stunning, wild and wacky cakes for all occasions. Baking is just something that's been a part of her life long before it became a way of life for her. I baked with both of my grandmothers. My mom baked a little bit. I have a cousin that bakes quite a bit. So baking was kind of something that I grew up with. And then uh, and being in the restaurant business, you kind of just are in tune to watching people and what they do, bakers, pastry chefs. And I always loved to bake. I used to try to make cakes for any reason, try to come up with a way to make a fun cake other than just a tra traditional iced cake. And then people started asking me if they could pay me to make cakes. So that's how that got started and it just got to be more and more. In 2006, she opened the Cake Barn next to her home and started her business, Aunt Bee's Cakes and Desserts. Ann makes everything from scratch, including the frosting. She self-taught and knows a thing or two about the food industry. Throughout her decorated career, she's worn many hats. I worked in restaurants my whole whole life, actually. Everything from bus and tables to washing dishes, cooking, managing a five-star restaurant, bartending. So I've always been in the food industry. Love, love food. I don't have any formal training. It's just trial and error. You do something, if it doesn't work, try it a different way. It doesn't matter if you have a sweet tooth or not, Anne's creations are a feast for eyes and taste buds. So good. 
I'm a pretty creative person. I wouldn't call myself an artist per se. I guess when I have a pastry bag in my hand, I'm an artist. But uh, just seeing what you can come up with, the ways, what you can do with sugar, manipulate it to make it look like it's not sugar, something real. Everything you see on her cakes is usually edible, like on this one. And she tries to incorporate local ingredients whenever possible. If you have a dream cake in mind, odds are Anne can bake it into reality. There's something specific they want on a cake. Maybe I can't make it exactly, but we can incorporate those interests and hobbies. That's why when for cake tastings, uh, for wedding cakes, I try to sit down with people and really get their vision. Because you want the cake to be, you want it to be unique to at your wedding. You want it to reflect you as a couple. I've done some wedding cakes that are just really unusual, very colorful wedding cakes. When you make these cakes, it's it's hard to pick a favorite because there's something different, like the baby shower cakes, you love those because they're so cute. And then wedding cakes, you love those because they're so pretty. Then you do comical cakes, birthday cakes. You know, I've done some pretty far out there cakes, some that, you know, you don't take pictures of because they shouldn't go in your album. <laughs> Nowadays, baking has gone by the way with many people leaving the fate of their sweets to the professionals. But if you're lucky enough to have Aunt B make your next cake, odds are, you'll be in for a treat. When you take a cake and you can make it very personal, that's the great thing. That's the fun thing for the person that's receiving the cake. If cake isn't your piece of pie, Ann Barraclaw can also whip up some other sweet desserts, some of which you can find at local area businesses. To learn more of her incredible creations, check out her website, cakesbyantbee.com. Now, as you know, Destination Michigan's outdoorsman Bob Garner is an avid hunter. Tonight, he's taking us to Beaverton, where A-Way Hunting Products makes unique deer and turkey calls. This time on Destination Michigan, I'm just north of one of my favorite Michigan towns, but I'm taking part in one of my favorite springtime activities. <laughs> Beaverton is where old friends Greg and Kim Abbas have their turkey and deer calling business, A-Way Hunting Products. Greg was Michigan's champion turkey caller for many years and still hand tunes every single turkey call that leaves his shop. Out front is a tribute to his father, Fred, who has put more Michigan bucks in the record book than anyone else. For years, Greg did a show called A-Way Outdoors on the Outdoor Channel with his dad, and a look at his trophy room shows that he's been around the world. When did you start calling, calling critters? I started calling critters when I was just a little kid. I'd come home from school and I'd practice, practice. I'd make animal noises. And, you know, here we are today because I made these noises. You know, we've got A-Way hunting products. We, we make these deer calls and turkey calls. And um, it was just a passion ever since I was a little kid. You've got to select turkey calls, the creme de la creme, that, uh, that, you, that don't go out of here until until they're tuned by you and signed by you. What, what's, what's the story behind that? We have made our niche with all these large companies on, on either side of us because we're extremely innovative. And that's what our company is known for, as is our turkey calls. And I wanna make sure that every turkey call that goes out sounds proper, sounds good. And I don't wanna put something out there that's just mass produced and um, doesn't sound right. I, I don't want them coming back. I want people to really like them. I like how they sound, uh, bring in those turkeys and I wanna see those pictures and I want them telling their friends how nice these calls are. So I enjoy tuning the calls. I enjoy having unique calls such as uh, the Turkey Trooper with volume control, very unique, probably our best seller. Um, the box call, the double trouble box call, another very unique one. Oh, yeah. uh, double chambered, and it, it's for a purpose. You know, it, it does special things. Tell me about your operation over here. You know, it's still a small family run operation. Um, Better that way, isn't it? I love it. I'm still hands on. You know what? If, if you call A Way Hunting Products and you need to talk to Greg Abbas, you're going to reach him. So, I like being smaller. Um, my wife or sister-in-law may answer the phone and you know they can handle most of the things, but um, it's nice that it's family run. I like keeping my hands on and, and keeping the pulse with the public. And you're, 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 you're right into it, still hunting turkeys here and there? Oh yeah, yeah, I love it. And I, I still love the turkey hunting, but I, I love calling for people uh, more than pulling the trigger myself. That's really nice. 
my advice to younger people up and coming now, including my daughter, follow your passion and the money will follow. When I moved away from the city, people thought I was crazy because there's a lot more money down sure. there. But you know what? I'm so happy up here and, and I love it. Nature is just outside my door. When I'm done with work, which is right next door to the house, I could come out here and, um, you know, we have a small farm. I could feed the chickens. I could go horseback riding, you know, I can do my gardening or go fishing in the pond or just go for a walk out back. I love it up here. I love Michigan and I love nature. More information about their products and services can be found at awayhunting.com. Now we'll conclude our episode with some Destination Michigan trivia for you. As you've learned in a previous episode, there's a Northern Michigan company that got started thanks to a laundry error. When her husband accidentally shrank her wool sweaters, Sue Burns created Baba Zuzu. So our trivia question for you is what town is the upcycled garment company based out of? Stay tuned for the answer. Support for Destination Michigan is provided by the CMU Bookstore. T-shirts, sweatshirts, hats, maroon and gold memories, and an official outfitter of Adidas apparel at the Central Michigan University owned and operated CMU Bookstore. Online shopping seven days a week at cmubookstore.com. The CMU Bookstore, online at cmubookstore.com, on campus in the University Center, and game day locations at Kelly Short Stadium and the CMU Events Center. Our Destination Michigan trivia question for the night. What town is upcycled garment company Baba Zuzu based out of? The answer is Lake Leelanau. You can find one-of-a-kind Baba Zuzu designs in retail shops across the state, across the country, and across the globe. Now in celebration of completing their 20th season, Baba Zuzu recently decided to relaunch a baby and children's collection, as well as an all-new spring line to their website, babazuzu.com. Thanks for joining us tonight on Destination Michigan. We hope you'll tune in again and learn more about the state we all love to call home. <laughs>